16 in our song books. Three, one, six. Oh, come all ye faithful. Three, one, six. day we had in God's house this morning. I think three people got baptized. Praise the Lord for that. It's always exciting to see pastor baptized. Not saying because we had a couple of people get dunked twice. I'm not saying that, all right? A couple of people slipping, but we always have a good time there. Thank God for the message this morning. Boy, did pastor have his coffee and breakfast this morning? That was good, though. And by the way, thank God for a preacher that's willing to tell us the truth. Amen. And by the way, the interesting thing is you saw there was a round of applause in this section here. I think it's because they needed it the most, all right? But anyhow, we are excited about that. I'm enjoying this Christmas season. And I don't know about you guys, but I like to start Christmas right about halfway through Thanksgiving dinner. Amen. Getting ready for the decorations, getting the plans ready, trying to go on Amazon and purchase all the different gifts for the kids and family members. And then the gifts. Gift exchanges. They're getting more and more exciting. But I tell you what, as much as I enjoy the gifts and the gift exchanges and the holiday decor and the festivities, the greatest reason for Christmas is Jesus. Amen. The choir sang it this morning, joy to the world. And I don't know about you, but joy came to Charlie Chim's life when Jesus came and saved me. Amen. Not only did I have everlasting life, eternal life, but I also had the abundant life. Thank God for that. Let's go ahead and pray for a great service this evening. Father, thank you so much for the truth of Christmas. Thank you so much, Lord, that we get to celebrate you. And really, if we were to think about all the wonderful attributes and try to list them, the, all the attributes of that you embody, Lord, we would take forever because that's exactly what it is. You are that special. I really do pray that you would help us this year as a church to truly capture who you are and what you want to accomplish in our lives. Continue to bless our church. Be with this service, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated.
Thank you, choir, for that song. Let's stand together. 308 in our psalm books. 308, the first Noel. We'll sing that first and the last verse. Page 308. Let's sing it out together on that first verse. Sing it. The first Noel. son would give his life for the angel said that he would come to save the world from sin and strife so she watched him grow and pondered all these things within her heart and standing near his rugged cross she understood her part and standing near his cross she found the strength she longed for standing near the cross her tears were wiped away for she looked into her savior's eyes and saw the love he'd given as she was standing near the But thank God I'm not forsaken. Troubles come and enemies rise, but I am not destroyed. I lift up my head and look unto the God of my salvation. And standing near his rugged cross, my heart's renewed once more. And standing near his cross, I find the strength I long for Standing near the cross My tears are wiped away For I look into my Savior's eyes And see the love He's giving As I'm standing near the cross So when fears come and try and start to bring about defeat just find your way back to the cross and fall down at his feet and standing near his cross you'll find the strength you long for standing near the cross he'll wipe your tears away for you'll look into your Savior's eyes and see the love he's giving as you're standing near the cross. 
Songbooks as we're standing together. Thank you, ladies, for that song. Three, one, zero. Born to die. We'll sing the first and the last verse. Page 310. Let's sing it together on that first stanza. On the night Christ was born, just before break of morn, as the stars. seated. Just a couple of announcements, actually a few announcements here uh, today. I think this might be one of the fuller announcement sheets, and I'm excited. Pastor, uh, historically, sometimes December was a little bit of a lower, a downtime for the church, but pastors infused some uh, some Christmas energy in there and excited to do th some things, a lot of things with our church. But, of course, uh, Saturday prayer meeting and faithfulness rally continues. Uh, prayers at 930, rally at 10 o'clock, of course. Our uh, program continues next week, the last week of the program. So we had, uh, we had Christmas sweaters, we had tie and scarf. Congratulations, Brother Raul, still looking just as, uh, as good as you did this morning. But, and then next week, is, it's Christmas festival. You say, what is that? Pull out the elf ears or do what you got to do. Be festive, all right? Come in the best you can, and we'll have a, a great time. Of course, we do have, a, a, we have a, a cookie baking contest with five different categories. I think you all got a, an insert in the bulletin this morning for that. And then we're going to have a children's cookie decorating contest and uh, just t time together out there. It's going to be good. And then December 26th, we do have a special service schedule right the day after Christmas. And so uh, no, no Sunday school. We will have service at 10 o'clock, uh, just from 10 to 11. We'll have a quick break for some refreshments. And then uh, pastor says he's going to he's gonna preach a quick one. I don't know uh, on, on that day. But 1130 to 1230, get us on our way uh, there the day after Christmas. And then this Friday is our adult uh, Christmas fellowships, and so make sure you're there, and uh, quite a few new people. We, we had a good time at our Thanksgiving one. We're looking forward to this one, and we'll see how they do after the white elephant exchange. We tell them, get in the flesh, it's okay, but unify afterwards, get back in the spirit. Always a great time there. And then Christmas gift for Jesus is coming up. My wife and I are already uh, getting ready to give for that, and we, we need help with our, our parking situation. We just do. I went soul winning, Pastor knows, not too long ago, right here on Eucalyptus Street. And, and Tim said, ah, you know, sometimes it's good to go right on the same street as the church, and sometimes you can hear it from the neighbors. And it happened to be one of those times where one of the neighbors 
he said, oh, so you're from the church. And, and he talked to us about the parking situation. Now, since then, we've been able to have a really good relationship uh, with them. And I think that we've been trying, but we've we got to do something. We've got to do something. And having a shuttle to be able to get people back and forth who maybe otherwise couldn't or wouldn't park over there, we need that. And so if we can all, every one of us, do our part and give to that so we can get a shuttle bus and we can be good neighbors and keep the parking lot clear for uh, our, our visitors and older people or people that cannot walk. Then we do have a singles activity after the PM service on the 19th. Going to go see the Christmas lights and they'll eat before uh, they do that. Thankful for Pastor and all he's doing with the singles. I got to stop by the singles activity. Pastor, I think 50 people, more, but 50 people involved in the gift exchange. Imagine that, a white elephant with 50 people. That's the real reason they were there until 11.45 at night. It was that gift exchange. How do you do that? Two, three times stealing. I would have done steal it one time. That's it. Cut it, right? And so a uh, great time, but that's, uh, that's next week. And then Christmas Eve service, the 24th, the candles are already up in the office, ordered, ready to go. And so 5 o'clock to 5.50, a quick one, but a, just a Christmas Eve service with a uh, lot of singing, a brief message there as we think about Christ and his birth. And then this Tuesday, we do have the Christmas play, uh, and that's going to be our midweek service Tuesday night. And also our, uh, there's also going to be a challenge there. I do have two more. We'll be done. Uh, the Thang family. Tang family uh, would like to invite the church to the memorial service for Chanty, and that's going to be December 22nd, 11 o'clock in the Spanish Auditorium. So that's 11 o'clock, December 22nd. The church is invited to be part of that. And then finally, we're done. The, the Teen Windsor Camp is coming up, and uh, Miss, Missionary Josiah Goddard, who was here just a couple weeks ago, Brother Tongdi, Pastor Kyle Beck, myself will be preaching. It's December 27th through the 30th, and Brother Ross said this, this is the last day today to take advantage of the early discount. Now, we were laughing up here because he said he would actually rather you pay tomorrow because that's more money in the budget. So you do what you got to do. But I would take advantage of that. It's already on Simple Give. You can see them at the kiosk or see the office to pay. If you have a teenager, I would not. I was texting one of the guys who's in ministry somewhere else in the country this past week, and we agreed that winter camp and youth conference, some of the best decisions we've made in our life growing up, that got us to where we are today. Winter Cabin Youth Conference. If you have a teenager, get them there. You won't regret it. Thank you. Let's stand together, please. Our last song, we'll sing together. 304 in our song books. Away in the manger, 304. Let's sing it together on that first verse. Away in a manger, no crib. time Jesus is the reason for the season and when we come to uh, this part of the year we hear the word joy a lot uh, joy to the world and uh, you know Christ does bring joy but oftentimes culture and the world their definition of joy is not biblical and it's not right and we think about joy we think about man what am I going to get this Christmas am I going to get a some of the kids, a PlayStation 5 or a new Xbox or uh, a new this or a new that. Maybe, maybe it's something that they're looking forward to. And uh, oftentimes people believe, man, 
this will bring me joy if I get a certain thing. But you know what brings joy? is if we seek and we find and we do the will of God. Joy comes by, by, by living the Christian life. And I thank God for our people during this time that strive to live for the Lord. Uh, I think of uh, Brother, um, Brother Vong and his family. Uh, and I talked to him this past week. And as I was talking to him afterwards, <clears throat> I thought about his son. And we're out here at the candy machine. I remember buying him some hot Cheetos. And I, got, I said, hey, man, what do you want from the, um, the uh, machine? I want to say it was uh, Tyler. He says, I want hot Cheetos. I think it was Tyler. I might be wrong, but I'm almost certain it's Tyler. And I got that for him. I bought it with my own money, and I gave him the whole thing. Matter of fact, I even opened it up for him. Opened it up and gave it to him. And I just looked at him. I said, you're enjoying that? He says, yes, sir. And his mom was there, I remember. And I said, hey, buddy, can I have just one? He looked at me. And he said, no, this is mine. <laughs> and you know what? I felt kind of a little bit ripped off because I bought him the, the uh, uh, um, uh, hot chips. I opened it up for him. Really, if I wanted to, I could buy some more myself. But I wanted him to, say, uh, to share with me. And uh, I said, can I please have one? And he said, no, it's mine. His mom said to him, son, Brother Ross bought that for you. Give him one. And he opened up the bag. And I kid you not. He was looking for the smallest piece that was in there. And if he, he's probably going to watch this later on with his parents. I'm thinking it's you, Tyler. Um, and he, he looked for the smallest piece. And he pulled it out and he gave it to me. And I put it in my hand. Now, I didn't want to eat hot chips. But I stuck it in my mouth and I ate it. And I said, thank you. You know what? Uh, that's how the Lord is. He gave us everything we have. He owns everything. He can have much more. The Bible says he owns the cattle on the thousand hills. But yet the Lord says, you know what? Give and it shall be given unto you. He says, try me. Prove me. And many times we have Christians that we can give to God or uh, God has given us so much. But we don't stop to think, you know what? God owns everything. I just want to give back to him to show my appreciation. And, and that's why we give to the Lord. God has given us everything. Let's just give back to him as an appreciation we want to show to him. Let's pray. Father, we do praise you for, Lord, the opportunity to give. As we come to this season, Lord, we, a lot of people th think about getting. But really, Lord, it's about giving. You gave your son to die on the cross for us. You gave, Lord, your ultimate sacrifice of your life. You gave your blood to, Lord, save us from our sin. And Father, help us, Lord, to remember the reason for the season. Help us as we take this offering to remember to give to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Scripture reading for tonight is in the Old Testament book of Ruth, Ruth chapter 2. We're going to read verses 1 through 10, please, responsibly. Ruth chapter 2, it's right after the book of Judges. Ruth chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, we're going to read it responsibly. I'm going to read the um, odd verses, we'll read the even verses together. Once you find your place, if I could ask you to stand, please, to give honor to the Word of God. Ruth 
Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Again, I'm going to read the odd verses. We'll read the even verses together, please. Verse 1, the Bible says, And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabites said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. Then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, It is Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came, and has continued even from the morning until now, and she tarried a little in the house. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Let thine eyes be on the field that, thou, that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go unto the vessels, and drink of that which the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, and bowed herself to the ground, and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes? that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this evening. Heavenly Father, thank you once again for this time. that We can be back in church tonight. Thank you for blessing our service this morning, the message that we heard. Pray, Lord, that you once again challenge us and steer our hearts to the message you've given, Pastor, tonight. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated, please. Yeah. 
right, keep your Bibles open to the book of Ruth. We, we've been teaching on <coughs> the separation. We're going to take a few weeks off of that. I only have a couple messages left in that. We'll get into that into January. <clears throat> but there's a thought I want to share with us tonight, a very simple thought. We'll hit it from a few different angles uh, that I think will help us uh, as Christians if we will heed what is uh, or we uh, get the truth I'm trying to present to us tonight. I have found in my time of being a Christian, um, it's been a long time I've been a Christian, but also in being a part of a church, that the happiest people I know are those who are committed to and currently living in the will of God. That doesn't mean that people don't do that, have some degree of happiness, understanding the difference between happiness and joy. You know, as long as things are going right, I, I'm okay, but, but when problems come, as they do to everybody... Uh, we have a tendency to fall apart. But that's not true for the child of God who is living in the will of God. Not to say that someone that lives in the will of God, they're perfect. Not to say that they are problem free. But to say that they do experience uh, what the Jesus told us is called the abundant life. The life that has meaning. Uh, the life that has purpose and all of those different things. And things that really go far beyond what this world could really offer. On the other hand, I could tell you about others who, who aren't in the will of God or who at one time were in the will of God and no longer, uh, and no longer are that things maybe don't seem to go as well for them. Something changed. Something caused them to derail. And I'm not saying... Uh, that everybody that, that, that gets out of the will of God, they're going to get hit by a freight train or, you know, uh, you know something bad's going to drastically happen to them. I've, I've heard stories and messages like that, and that's not necessarily true. Uh, that does happen to some, but that's not necessarily true. But uh, just as tragically, they lose purpose in life. Just as tragically, they lose that joy in life. And really, most tragically, they have problems in their relationships and their responsibilities that they did not have to have. But regardless of what happens to anybody who leaves the will of God, or they stop being committed to follow his ways, there is one thing that's true of all of them. And the thing I want us to be careful about tonight, if we leave the will of God, if we leave the place that God has for us, we leave everything on the table that God had intended for us. That's sad. A lot of people don't believe that. They feel that if something better is placed on the table, they would forsake God's will in a minute. Whether that's a job where you're making more money, whether that's an individual that you want in your life, but you can miss whatever God has for you. Um, uh, I remember I, 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 heard, I heard an interview years ago with Terrell Davis. Tim will know who he is. Terrell Davis was running back for the Denver Broncos. Um, I think he's a Hall of Famer, and uh, we all know John Elway, and he couldn't win a Super Bowl. He didn't win a Super Bowl until Terrell Davis was on that team, and he doesn't win a Super Bowl without Terrell Davis. And Terrell Davis is a good guy. I actually found out he actually played the last year that Long, Long Beach State had a football team. But he told the story how he was not a high draft pick, and he was brought into their training camp, and so he was going through training camp, and they were playing a preseason game. And they were not playing him in the preseason game. And he said he was on the sideline, and he had already decided, I'm not making the team, I'm done with football, and he was ready to move on. He said he actually, during the game, went and snuck and got some hot dogs. And he said he was on the sideline eating and like, you know, hey, my career's over, I, I gave it a good try. And uh, he said he was eating on the sideline, and he, his, he was a little bit full. And he said somebody got injured, and they said, hey, you, in the fourth quarter, they said, go, go, go do uh, kickoff coverage. And he went out there for kickoff coverage, and he cut through everybody. They kicked off, and he just wiped this guy that caught the ball out, and it caught the, it caught the attention of the coaches. Now, he said because of all the hot dogs, he went to the sideline and was getting sick. But he said that changed his whole perspective, and that changed the perspective of the coaches. But he was that close to quitting and missing out on everything that he got. Sadly, that's what happens to a lot of Christians. That's kind of what I want to look at tonight. You know the story of Ruth if you've been a Christian any time at all. In chapter 1, uh, Elimelech moves his family 
because of a uh, because of a, a, of a drought, he moves his family to Moab. It was better there. There was only one problem with that. God told them, "Don't be involved with those people. Don't go over there." But yet, because of a drought, he found a reason to go. So he goes over there, and he has his wife and his two sons. His two sons. You know, they find Moabite women. Now, they're not supposed to marry Moabite women. Typically, uh, God says don't marry that, marry them because they're, they were pagan idol worshipers. And typically what happens if you marry someone like that, you forsake God and you move and you start doing those type of things. And God says don't do that. But they did. Eventually, Elimelech dies and his two sons die. So his wife is left with his two daughters-in-law. And Naomi's there with them. And she finally, after years, decides the famine is over in my hometown. I'm going to go back. So she gets her two daughters-in-law together and says, listen, I, don't want you to, I want you to stay here with your family and your gods and all that stuff. Don't come with me. They both say, no, 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 we're going to follow you because that would have been, in essence, the right thing to do because they have to help take care of their mother-in-law. And she says, no, 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 leave. And the other one says, okay. And she bails. But Ruth fulfills her responsibility and shows, she goes with her. They end up in Bethlehem and they show up in town and, you know, they, they don't look good. And, and, and Naomi, they come and see Naomi and say, wow, you're, you're back. And Naomi says, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. Mara means bitter. She was bitter at all that happened because she blamed God for it. But God didn't make the decision to leave. They did. And so Ruth is there. As we get to chapter 2, as they pull into town, they don't have anybody to take care of them, and so they have to fend for their own way. And so Naomi says, uh, Naomi, being a good daughter-in-law and helping to fulfill the responsibility to help in the family, says, I'll go out and I'll glean in the fields. That was God's way of taking care of the poor back then. Uh, when they would harvest their fields, there was part of the fields that the, that the landowners were not allowed, the corners, they were not allowed to harvest those. Those were, those were to be left for the poor people. As they were picking up the harvest, if they dropped any, they were not allowed to pick it up. That was left for the poor people. And so those that were poor or needed assistance, they could go and they could glean in the fields and pick up what they needed to survive. By the way, it wasn't just handed out to them. That's not a good thing, by the way. Now, I understand we need help sometimes, but we've created a society of people that they live on handouts. God said, you can have a handout, it's laying there for you, but you better go get it, and that's a story for another day. And I struggle with that sometimes. I know people struggle, my, but I, I remember my mom, and she had to raise, there was five of us, in the four of us, my sister had already married and left the family, and she was a single mom. She never took any help. I know sometimes people need help. I'm not, I'm not harping on that. But my mom worked to make sure we had what we needed. But that's what, was Ruth, that's what Ruth was doing. But it's interesting. She goes into the field of a near kinsman. See, uh, Naomi's family had lost their property, but it, it could be redeemed by, a near, by, a, near, uh, by a, a near kinsman there, someone in their family. And she just happens to go into that field. She just happens to go to his well, she's out there, uh, she's out there uh, working and, you know, and she's, she's collecting the food and everything. And here comes Boaz, who she doesn't know is a near kinsman. Him being single and not being blind notices her gleaning and says, hey, who's that? Now, let me just explain what he means like, wow, <laughs> what is this all about? And they explain to her, he's explained to him like, oh yeah, she's back with Naomi, and he's like, okay, I'm a kinsman here. I, I can, by the way, what that meant is he could redeem their property, and he got, he would get to marry her. It's not like that thing on the internet where you download a bride, none of that stuff, okay? But this was something how God's way to keep, keep the land and keep the family going. And if you know the story well, it all works out. I'm paraphrasing, read it when you get home. And uh, they get married... And they have a child together. And that child is in the lineage of Jesus Christ. And Naomi, who was once bitter, now is back. And God takes care of their family. And she gets to actually take care of this child. Now, uh, how did that happen? Look at verse 3. I'm going somewhere. I'll make a quick point, a few, a few thoughts, and we'll get out of here tonight before 8. Verse 3, and just see if you're listening. 
And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. That The reapers, they would reap and whatever they dropped, she got. And her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. What a coincidence. Right? It's not a coincidence. God had this planned out all along. See, that was the will for her life. God knew way back in the past, this needed to happen so this could take place and that could take place and I already had her plan and I already had her in the lineage of the Savior. It just needed to play out. And it played out exactly like it was supposed to. But let me just say this. Although she was in God's will, she still could have missed out. She could have missed out on everything God had for her and spent the rest of her life maybe unmarried, maybe struggling to make ends meet to help take care of her mother if she had done one thing. Look at verse 8 and 9, and we'll get to the message. Verse 8, then said Boaz unto Ruth. She's just, this is the first field she went to, right? There's no ulterior plan there. She's just, I'll go to this field today. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, hearest thou not? He figures her out and he starts talking to her. Hearest thou not, my daughter, goest not to glean in another field, neither go from fence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Now, okay, he, he, he noticed her, you know what I'm saying? It's like, all right, sister, sister's doing well. All right, I, 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 okay, I found another story. She's beautiful, and, and I'm interested. So he nonchalantly, like, you know what, don't go somewhere else. Just stay in my field. Just work it out here. But there could have been a problem. Look at verse 9. Lest thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have not I charged the, the young men that they shall not touch thee? You know, look, these young men here, don't worry about it. They're not going to make uh, advances at you. They're not going to be improper with you. I, I've already told them, leave her alone. Do you understand where he's coming from, right? You get that? I want her to stay here. You guys stay away from her. I got this covered. By the way, you know what else he did? They, they gave her extra. It's like she gleaned in the field, and it's like, hey, hey just make sure, make sure she gets loaded up, all right, so she doesn't go anywhere else. He didn't want her to go anywhere else, and he says, you know what? Keep your eyes on the field where you're at. Don't go anywhere else. You see, here's the problem. In order for God's will to have been fulfilled in her life, she, where, by the way, she was at the right place, everything was happening, he noticed, the, the stories going forward, she had to stay in place. She had to stay in that field. She had to stay in the place God had for her. She needed to focus on where she was at, because if not, she could have skipped and said, hey, let's go try another field today. And who knows? The story would have been drastically different. You know why some people get away from God's will? Because God's will? they start to focus on something else. They're not focused on what God has for them. They're not, they're not in on what God wants for their life and at one time maybe they were but, but now other things are coming into play and other things are coming into their life and now they're looking at other places. That's what God wants for us. God wants us to stay in his will. Do you understand the choices you make are determining your destination for the future? Do you understand although God has something for you, and by the way, whatever God has for you, when you do it, you'll be fulfilled. But when you get out of that place and go somewhere else, you're missing out on what God has for you. And let me say this, regardless of what it is, God, what God has for you is immensely better than anything else you can get. But we have an enemy who gets us to focus on something else. Don't let that happen. I want us to be focused on being pl in place tonight. What is involved, and that's what I want to tell you in the few minutes we have left, in focusing on our field, in focusing on our place, and understanding that where we're at, if it's in God's will, is the best place for us to be. First of all, you need to focus on finding it. You need to focus on finding it. 
You have to find God's will. Now let me say this, and I mentioned it this morning when we talked about Jonah. God's will is, is very, very, very clearly laid out in his word. And if you don't follow God's word, there's nothing else God can do with you. Well, what does God want me to do for my career? I don't know, follow his word first. Well, what does God have? Does God have something for me? Who does he want me to marry? And all these different things. I know this, if we're not committed to following his word, why would God lay all those things out for us? And let me say this, I believe all those things are found out as we are following God's word. See, we're looking, for some, we're looking for some mystical thing. And I've heard the stories too, and they're true. You know, God wanted me to go here, and he led this series of events, and I saw, and it made, I get all that, but that's not how typically God works. God typically works as we're committed to following him day by day by day. You want to find God's will for your life? You want to find God's place? Here's what you do. Get up tomorrow. That's a good start, by the way. Try to do it before noon, if that fits into your schedule. But get up tomorrow and do what God wants you to do tomorrow. And then Tuesday, get up and do that again. But make sure you're here because the service is on Tuesday night, not Thursday. So make sure you're here. It's a school play. And do that on Wednesday. Look, at, maybe I'm just, I, I've not had any of these magical, not magical, uh, uh, mystical, oh, not so, uh, I haven't had any of those moments where like this was just clearly laid out. I've just tried to follow God and when something came my way, God, you want me to do it? If God want me to do it, I do it. And guess, and, and, I'm, gonna, and I'm landed to where he wants me to be. Let's just follow him. We have to find it. How do we find God's will? Well, first you have to be silent. See, what do I mean by that? Ruth was directed through all of this by Naomi. You see, she came home that first day, and she had this stuff. She was gleaning the field, and Naomi knew, like, okay, you're probably only going to get this much stuff. You know, you only get so much gleaning the field. And she was loaded up. And she's like, okay, wait a minute. What happened here? How come you have so much? And she knew. She goes, okay, someone noticed you. Someone was helping her, and she tells it, and she goes, he's a near kinsman. Here's what you do. And she laid out the process whereby it would be presented to Boaz that they were interested, and God worked that whole thing out. But she had to not listen to herself. She had to listen to God's guidance in her life. And let me just say this. People don't want to listen to God's guidance. We are so stuck sometimes that we want to do our own thing and we're not willing to listen to those that would help us to get to where we need to be. I'm thankful for many decisions in my life. One of the decisions I made was to listen to my pastor to go to Bible college. And I'm not going to go through the whole story. I didn't even ask him about it. I went to talk to him for no good reason at all. And he said, you need to go to Bible college. And I'm like, whoa. I didn't even finish high school. School isn't my thing. He, and by the way, they didn't have a Bible college at their church. It was in Indiana. Indiana is a place where it's cold. My first Christmas there, it was 82 below zero. And we were out all day Saturday visiting on our bus routes. By the way, you little whiners that don't go on your bus route, try that. I'm getting ready to go on my bus route, and I turn the radio on, and the weatherman said, the weather today is a life-threatening 82 below zero. And I'm going to get dropped off in the middle of nowhere on my bus route without a car and visit. I spent a lot of time discipling people that, that day. But I went to college because my pastor told me to. I would never, I wouldn't have, married, I wouldn't have met my wife. Most days that's, that's a good deal. I wouldn't have met my wife. I wouldn't be where, I wouldn't be anywhere. I could see how God used that. He knew that's what I needed. Sometimes we have our own plans in place. If we're not open to finding God's will and in, in, in not doing our own thing, we'll never find it. See, he stud was a very wealthy, a son of a very wealthy businessman. He was saved in the late 1800s. Uh, uh, his dad was saved in the late 1800s. He went to a D.L. Moody revival. Uh, he had three sons, one of which was C.T. Studd. He was a very famous cricket player. That was, he was, he was, he'd be like a high-end athlete of our day. And, um, and so he had a lot going on. He had everything the world had to offer, but he was a backslidden Christian. One day, he was, uh, he was around, and a friend had gotten a track. Now get this, from an atheist. An atheist wrote a track trying to encourage people to atheism. C.T. Studd got that track and he read it. 
Here's what the atheist said. The atheist said this. If I, firmly, if I firmly believed, as millions say they do, that the knowledge and practice of religion in this life influences destiny in another, religion would mean everything. I would cast away earthly enjoyments. This is an atheist, by the way, people, and he's preaching here, and it's good. I would cast away earthly enjoyments as dross, earthly cares as folly, and earthly thoughts and feelings as vanity. Religion would be my first waking thought. And my last image before sleep puts me into unconsciousness. I would labor in its cause alone. I would take thought of the, for the morrow of eternity alone. I would esteem one. This is an atheist. I would, I would have esteemed one soul gained for heaven worth a life of suffering. C.T. Studd read that track and it changed his life. He says this of it. When I looked back upon my whole life, I saw how inconsistent it had been. I therefore determined from that point, time forth, my life should be consistent. And I set myself to know what God's will was for me. An atheist. But let me just say this. He had everything the world had to offer. He could have very, very easily dismissed that and went on his merry way living a life of wealth. We have to be silent. We have to be li willing to listen to what God is telling us to do. And then we have to be submissive to it. See, desiring what God wants to do wants, well, for my life and knowing what God wants for our life is worthless unless we're not submitted to actually listening to it. And most, that's where it stops for most people. But we, we're, we don't want to know because we don't want to do it. I mentioned the story many before, but I had a friend, he was in Bible college, and he was dating this girl, and he, his, his thing was they were that close, he was ready to get engaged. And then in a chapel, God spoke to his heart, and he told her, he goes, I think God wants to be a missionary. She quit dating him immediately. By the way, good for him. That's not who you want to be hooked up with. But that's how most people are. I read a story, there was a, an old Scottish lady, and she would travel from place to place selling different goods. And so she would, when she would go from one city to another, she would throw a stick in the air. And wherever the stick landed, whatever to play it pointed, that's the way she went. That was her next city. Well, a guy came by one time, and she was throwing the stick in the air, and she'd pick it up and throw it again and again and again. He goes, what are you doing? She goes, well, I always follow where the stick tells me to go, but sometimes it doesn't point in the direction I want it to. Isn't that how most of us are, right? We'll go wherever God wants us to go as long as where he wants us to go is where I want to go. I'll, I'll marry whoever God wants me to marry as long as that's the person I want to marry. And by the way, if God points out the person he wants you to marry, you'll want to marry them, all right? But we, we have to be submissive. And then we have to be steadfast to it. We have to be firmly committed to doing what God wants us to do once we find it. Secondly, the second part of it is once we find it, we have to focus on being faithful to it. See, it's one time thing to find God's will. It's another thing to actually start down that path, but it's another thing to actually stay on that path. And I'll just be honest with you. Too many people have jumped off the path. Oh, you can find all of your reasons. Well, someone was mean to me. <laughs> Get in line. Can I just tell you this? They're going to be mean to you no matter where you go. Well, you know, uh, sometimes, and I, I'm not, you know, I don't like a, a, a rule in the school. Listen, the, the school rules are not scripture. We're just trying to keep everything right now. We're trying to keep the kids in place. Okay, you got to have some type of organizational, organizational structure. Or, you know, or someone was critical. By the way, don't listen to critical people. You might want to find out how the end of the story is for them. But we get off of it. What causes us? Well, first of all, there could be an allurement of another place. Look at verse 8. He says, Then said Boaz said unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field. I mean, as you're walking, she could have looked and said, Hey, this field has, seems to have a better crop. It seems like my fortune would be better over on this field. But Boaz said, Hey, just stay right here. And by the way, when she decided to stay right there, he took care of her. I mean, he abundantly took care of her. Isn't that what God does for us? We look at other fields, we, we go around and like, well, that just seems like a better place. Is it really? It, does, it seems like a better place, but is it a more spiritual place for you? And, I, and over and above that, is that the place for you? 
we get so caught up. Things look nicer. Everything seems to be better. Problems always show up when there's a gap between the, between the place we choose and the one that God chooses. And by the way, everything always does look better. That's what Satan does. You know, well, I go over there, that'll be better. No, no, no. You know, they say the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. It's still got to be worked. It's still got to be mowed. Okay? You know, I, and I know during this COVID thing and everybody wants to move to, oh, I want to go to Florida. I want to go to Texas. Have fun with that. I lived in one of them, Florida, and I couldn't get out of there fast enough. I remember when we loaded up our car and left, when we crossed that, when we crossed that line into, I believe it's Alabama, I got out of the car and I said, Lord, I'll never go back there, not even for a visit. Okay? Not saying that Florida's bad, it's just that that was not God's will. And because it wasn't God's will, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't leave fast enough. And I only drove through Texas, okay? But, but it's just, we, we're always looking for something better. And it's may not, and it's not going to work. If it's not enough, it's God's will. But if it's not, it's not going to work out. You can get the best job, the biggest house, the most money. You can have all that stuff and be miserable. Be miserable. It's got to be God's will. As we mentioned earlier, we talked about CT, CT Stud. When he decided to do God's will, his dad, who got saved at a D.L. Moody revival, didn't want him to do it. He was going to be a missionary. They tried everything. The dad had his pastor come to talk him out of it. He went to the pastor, I don't want him to leave. Go tell him to stay here. Then, oh, mom's sick. Because his dad was looking at it from a strictly worldly point of view. By the way, parents, let's make sure that we don't try to do God's will for our children. Well, I know you can serve God, but I just prefer that you go out and make money. Now, by the way, I'll say this. I'm not against people making money if it's not, you know, if it's legal, right? I understand offerings, and I understand, look, if God's blessed you, and that's his goal for your life, and you've got a good job making money, amen. Let's make sure we're generous with that. But, but, but if that's not God's will for your life, you'll be miserable if you, if you, could, if you made millions and millions and millions. Let's find God's will. And as parents, sometimes we try to shoehorn our kids into what we want for them instead of saying, listen, what does God want for you? Then sometimes we just abandon our place. Verse 8, he says, don't clean another field, neither go from thence. Don't leave. Don't leave. If you found God's place, sometimes times might get a little, a little tough. Don't leave. Don't leave. Sometimes, seems, sometimes things might be up in the air or maybe your emotions out of kilter. Don't leave. Understand that following God's will is the best thing that you can ever do. Don't quit. And then sometimes we go because we want to go to someone else's place. He goes, but abide here fast by my maidens. He goes, listen, the ladies that are working here, hang with them. They'll, they'll, they'll take care. They're, this is where you need to be. They're going to help keep you in the field. Don't let someone else try to pull you out. Stay with this. By the way, don't let people pull you away from God's will. People do that all the time. Oh, yes, they do. You start hanging out with someone who's not spiritual, and they start dragging you down. You start hanging out with someone that pushes you towards something else. They start dragging you down. By the way, we give our peers way too much, way too much uh, power in our lives. Not saying that sometimes our peers cannot be spiritual and help us. I'm not saying that. But you can tell. You start hanging around and people are critical and nitpicky. Well, you know, I went to that winter camp and I, and I got called and I walked down the aisle. That's just emotion. Maybe for them. What about you? Listen, let God deal with you one-on-one. -on -one. Don't let anybody chisel away at that. Because let me just, someone comes to my office and says, you know, uh, God wants me to do that, blah, blah. I'm not going to push them to my will because I don't have to live it. Now, I'll try to help encourage them as they're finding God's will, but, like, they better be committed to it because they're the ones that are going to have to live it. But we don't like that, do we? We don't like that commitment that it takes. And you, well, thank you, I'm glad. But it's very important we don't let anybody else push us. And then lastly is this. Focus on finishing. Focus on finishing. You know, if you like sports, you, you can, whatever sport you follow, there's always teams at the beginning of the year that get off to a great start. Don't, don't smile, brother, too. I hate the Braves. Um, 
there's always, there's always teams that'll get off to a great start. And early in the year, it's like, this is the team that's going to win it, man. Look at how far ahead they are. And then they fall apart. It doesn't matter who, who's standing at the beginning of the year. You know what matters? Are you standing at the end? It, it doesn't, it, look, I follow God's will today, but let me just tell you something. Don't lose it. Do you understand when you, you finish God's will, as you're traveling on that path, God brings the right people around? Some of the best friends you'll ever have, some of the most spiritual people that will encourage you are these people that you meet when you're in God's will. And by the way, look for those people. People that lift your spirits. People that encourage you in God's will. You don't find that outside of God's will. You find that outside of people that, you know, they're pushing you a different direction. Let's lessen what we're doing. After all, do we have to do this? Do we have to? No, you don't have to do anything, but all of us need to do God's will. You don't have to. But guess what? You also don't have to experience the blessing God has for your life when you do. You find the purpose that God has for you. I'm glad there's more to this life than what's going on now. One of the reasons as Christians with, look, I, I could get up here and, and preach message after message on how horrible our society is. And the older you are, the more you understand how bad it's gotten a lot quicker. Than, look, 20, 25 years ago, we would be repulsed at what's going on in our society today. And it was bad back then. I read a book years ago, in 1981, when I, was, when I was first serving God. It was called Sodom Had No Bible. And one of the statements he made in the book, he says, if America doesn't change, God is either going to have to judge us or apologize to Sodom. That was 40 years ago. Things have changed drastically. And if I looked at this world from what's going on now, I would be depressed. But I don't. I look at it from God's perspective. When I look at it from God's perspective, I may not like what's going on. I may try to do what I can to foster change from what's going on. But when it's all said and done, I know where I'm going, and it's all going to be good. And I want to help other people get there. Why? That's a better purpose than, than what's going on here now. What's the message tonight? The message tonight is stay where you're supposed to be. Make God's will the biggest thing in your life. Everything you're looking for in life is found in God's will. Years ago, I preached a message in chapel. I had a little, and I don't, I'm not a prop guy. I had a little box. I'm like, here's what you're looking for, college students. I pull a spouse, a job, you know, all these different things. I'm like, where do you find all of these things that's in the box? Well, the box is God's will. You can find those things outside of God's will, but they're nowhere near as good. You can buy a Gucci bag in Cambodia. My daughter Allison got me one. It lasts about three months. And it fell apart. It wasn't legit. It wasn't genuine. You can find all that stuff outside of God's will, but it's not genuine. It's not legit. It's fake. What do you want tonight? Everything you want in your life, if you would just push away all the noise and all the other stuff, it's found in God's will. And whatever you get in God's will, you will love it. Because that's what God created you for. Let's bow our head and close our eyes tonight. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. We know the story of Ruth well. It's a great love story. I remember years ago I read one of the presidents was either late 1800s, early 1900s, one of our presidents. He had a party. He was sitting down talking with some friends, and he told a love story. So I'm going to tell you a love story. He told him this story, and the people that were listening said, that's an amazing story. Where did you read that? He said, I read it in the Bible. It's the book of Ruth. It is a great love story. But can I just tell you something? It could have been derailed in chapter 2 had she not stay, stuck in the place that God directed her to. And she would have missed out on everything. How about you? You have to think in your life in terms of the end. When I get to the end of my life, am I going to be like Paul? Who said, I finished my, I finished my, I finished my, I've been the course, I'm at the end, and I know I've done what I'm supposed to do. Or will you look back with regret? That's one thing I don't want to look back at. I mean, all of us, we're going to look back and say, man, I wish I would have been, I could have done more of this. I'm not talking, I'm talking about serious regret. 
serious regret. Let's stand this, this lesson stand this evening. I don't know if God spoke to you, but if he did, why don't you come? There's always reasons, and Satan will always throw things at us to discourage us from God's will. When we take our eyes off it and we start to look at other things, you young people and you singles, as you start to, to move out in life and become adults, things will come your way that you're not having to deal with now, and you're going to have to make a decision. Am I going to follow what the world says is the path I should go? Or am I going to follow God's path? You young married and couples and those of us that have children, our decisions will determine the fate of our children. We may be wrecking their God's will in their life or we may put them on a course that's making it harder for them because of the decisions we're making. Let's just stay in our place. Let's not look around. Let's not get distracted. Father, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for your word. Just the simple principles we can learn that are scriptural from the stories throughout. We pray, Father, that no one in this room would be distracted from leaving the place you have for them. Such a small, seemingly small decision could derail everything you had planned for them everything you had planned for us. I pray you'd help us to stay on course. Help us to realize that your field, your place is the best place we could ever be. And may we desire no other place. Bless us now until we meet together again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being faithful. Thank you for a great day in church. Just a reminder, our service, our midweek service is on Tuesday. It'll also be our school play, so we're excited about that. 7 o'clock right here. We look forward to seeing you. God bless you. You may have, uh, oh, I'm sorry, wait, we're going to sing a verse. 545 as we dismiss. Jesus loves even me. Let's sing it together. On that first verse, sing it. I am so glad that our Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am